You probably already know about this crime. It's the murder of a young boy, Yusef Bell. It happened last October the 21st. Yusuf's mother and he were visiting neighbors at this southwest Atlanta address. A little before 5 o'clock that Sunday afternoon, Yusuf asked if he could go to the store for a neighbor for a box of snuff. He'd done that before. It was not unusual. So he took the same route as before, through a hole in the fence to the store. But he never came back. So neighbors started a search. That search did not end until November the 8th, when Yusuf's body was found at this old school on Capitol Avenue at Georgia Avenue. He had been strangled, and his body was put into the shaft in the floor. A murder victim at age nine. If you know anything about this killing, please call Crime Stoppers at 588-1770. Remember, you do not have to give your name. Yet you can collect up to $1,000 reward for helping solve this crime or any felony crime in the metro Atlanta area. And we have a special message for code numbers 114 and 82. Please call Crime Stoppers. They have a few more questions they'd like to ask. For Crime Stoppers and Action News, I'm Jim Wilkerson. For two years, the bodies of black children had been found in the woods, then the rivers of Atlanta, Georgia. In all, more than two dozen victims, most of them strangled. By May 1981, the police and FBI were hiding in the brush, beside and below the river bridges. This was to be the last night, almost the last hour. I heard the, heard the splash. Bob Campbell, a police recruit, jumped to his feet down beside the Chattahoochee River. I was really startled. It sounded like a body entering water. He looked up at the bridge. And I saw brake lights of a car come on. I saw red lights. The car started slowly moving away from me across the bridge. Campbell radioed the other team members up above him. I asked, did a car stop on the bridge? Because, it, you know, I couldn't believe what I saw. And each person told me they didn't see it. Then a policeman in a chase car, hidden on the other side, came on the radio. He just said, the car is pulling into the parking lot here, turning around in front of me. I uh, started coming back across the bridge, coming back in my direction. This is that white station wagon. Police followed it and stopped it nearby. FBI agent Mike McComas rushed to the scene. The driver was standing by the highway. He was talking with the officers, um, saw a black male. He had on a, a baseball hat, had on glasses. The young man was Wayne Williams, about to turn 23, a self-anointed music talent scout who slept days and roamed the city at night. McComas invited Williams over to his car. He got in the car and I said, do you know why we're here? And he immediately said, yes, it's about the missing children. And that kind of stunned me and I said, well, what do you know about that? And he goes, well, he said, I don't think that the various uh, news agencies are covering it adequately, do you? Two weeks later, this headline would break the news of that night on the bridge. Wayne Williams would be sent to prison to serve two life sentences for murder. At first glance, he hardly looks like a serial killer. Not much more than five and a half feet tall, barely 150 pounds, now in his 50s and growing bald. The bottom line is nobody ever testified or even claimed that they saw me strike another person, choke another person, stab, beat, or kill, or hurt anybody, because I didn't. This is the first time Wayne Williams has talked on TV in at least a decade. Why do you think you were convicted? Fear. What do you mean? Atlanta at the time was in a panic. They wanted any suspect that they could find, and let's just be honest, it had to be a black person, because if it had been a white suspect, Atlanta probably would have gone up in flames. It came very close to that. Do you think you'll ever be free? No, Dad, it's not a matter of, of if to me. It's a matter of when. It was this mother, after the loss of her nine-year-old son, who finally forced police to listen, but not until almost a year after her boy died. Camille Bell and her children lived in these project apartments, poor to the eye, 
but rich in mind and spirit. Yusef Bell was an honor student in the gifted program at school. On a warm October Sunday in 1979, he walked away on an errand to buy snuff for an elderly lady downstairs. He went barefooted in a pair of brown shorts. He got to the store, he bought the snuff, he started back home. Less than half a block from this store, Yusef Bell stepped off this curb and vanished. And nobody saw anybody do anything or anything, but they did see him come back across the street. And that's the last that we saw him. Camille Bell called the police. They came and said they'd write a report. That's all. Days went by. Camille waited with two older children and Yousef's three-year-old sister. And so she is terrified. Um, if he can go to the store and they can steal him, then she doesn't want to leave the house. She doesn't want to do anything. Camille hid her own fear from her children. And you've got to hold them together so you can't act as scared as you are. The body of Yusef Bell was found in an abandoned schoolhouse. His body would not turn up for another month. Yusef Bell had been strangled. All of the what could have been, should have been, and probably would have been was taken away. And we'll never know now because somebody decided that it was all right to just kill a little kid because they wanted to. For years, it has been a dirty little secret among the press and the police. Deaths of blacks draw less attention than deaths of whites. Nobody cared, so you could have several killings go on, and if the people were poor, then no one discovered there was a serial killing. If you were black and poor, then really nobody looked, especially if you were black and poor and Southern. What's going on, Graveyard Shift family? It's your Fear the Shift leader, Daylin, clocked in for another amazing shift. Family, I have been getting a lot of requests uh, just about tackling this story. So right now, I am in Atlanta, Georgia at the South View Cemetery. Now, this is the same resting community that Hank Aaron is buried. Um, Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mother is buried. So these are two people that we've actually gone to this resting community to and have spoken to. But we're here for another reason today. Something way, way more dark. So I moved to Atlanta in 2003 to go to college. I moved here from Dallas, Texas. And I remember when my friends and family in Dallas found out that I was moving to Atlanta. Someone in that in that I don't know I, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have would have I think it it might have been like a friend of mine but like their parents told them so they were like you know be careful in atlanta you know they snatch kids up in atlanta like what who going around snatching kids up in atlanta y'all they was out here snatching kids up in atlanta what listen to me What's insane to me is like, you never really understand the magnitude of something until it like hits close to home. So you can hear stories about things. And like, like I remember even when 9-11 when happened, like it was tragic, it was, a tr it was a tragedy. But like right when it happened, being in Texas and in, in school at that time, we understood that it was messed up, but we didn't understand like the magnitude of 9-11 
as opposed to people that were up north, like in the DC, New York, who had family members who worked in the trade, in the World Trade Center, and like draw, like that was so far away from us in the country and so far out of our day to day that albeit we were that albeit we were mortified of the act it was just like it didn't really just sit like the devastation you know what i'm saying until later on and i think that's kind of similar to this atlanta child murder situation almost 30 kids and young adults were killed during this two-year period and outside of atlanta you you hear about people dying during that time frame but you didn't understand the magnitude of what it felt like to be a young black kid teenager young adult living in atlanta during that time What's wild is I came here yesterday to uh, try to find the resting space for a couple of the victims of the Atlanta child murder. And the people working here at the Southview Cemetery have probably been some of the most helpful individuals I've ever been um, in contact with at a resting community. But uh, a woman, I'm not going to say her name because <laughs> she might not want to be involved in none of this. Uh, she works here and she took me through the resting community to the grave of the gentleman that we're going to speak to today. And while we were standing at his grave, we were just talking about it. And I was telling her I'm from Dallas. I live in Atlanta now. And I was following this case of the Atlanta child murder. And I just wanted to come pay my respects and visit one of the victims. And she was like, yeah, I remember living in this community when this was going on. And I was like, oh my gosh, I could only imagine like that was the talk of the town. And she was like, what? The talk of the town? She was like, nah, that don't even come close to what it was. She was like, do you understand that like we couldn't go outside? Like our parents wouldn't allow us to go outside because of what was happening to the kids in our community. She was like, almost 30 people were killed in that time frame. It was almost becoming a child a week, they were saying. She said it was some of the most terrifying moments she's ever had, like ever. And to only imagine going through that as a child. But what's insane is, what's insane is, nobody actually, actually knows if all of these victims were killed by the same person. Now, the man who was arrested for all of these murders was a man named Wayne Williams. But here's the thing. Wayne swears up and down to this day that he's innocent. Wayne is incarcerated right now for two murders of two adults of the 28 odd people that uh, he's accused of killing. But the problem is they say he claims that once that they arrested him, they just stopped looking. You know what I mean? So if you stop looking, then you stop finding. So you say that all the murders stopped now that you have arrested Wayne Williams, but in all actuality, Wayne is saying the murders probably have kept going, but you just stopped paying attention. Albeit, I don't even know if that was the transition I was looking for. Uh, 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 check this out. Uh, let me give you another transition. Uh, but here it is. <laughs> One of the mothers of one of the victims, actually the mother of the victim that we're going to speak to today, isn't 100% sure that Wayne Williams is the actual murderer. She said that up until the last day of trial, which is on record, 
like Wayne lost it the last day of trial and started going crazy and like just being a totally different person, she didn't believe that he did it. So it kind of makes you think if the mother of one of the victims is unsure, this man is claiming his innocence, but there's just so many factors that point to this man. Literally 28 odd people were killed over a two year period. All, the majority of them being strangled or suffocated in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, Wayne wasn't a big dude, right? So a lot of them being children, I get, right? They said he was going around Atlanta, passing out flyers, trying to be a talent scout. They said that Wayne was trying to become the next, like, uh, Joe Jackson. Literally, not a joke. He was trying to build the next Jackson group. So he was passing out flyers in and around Atlanta. Y'all, excuse me, my sinuses and my allergies are still kicking me. He was passing out flyers in and around Atlanta for boys ages 8 to 12 to come audition for this group that he was creating that never got off the ground. So, uh, yeah, he was holding auditions. He was meeting young guys, young boys, and yeah. A lot of boys were coming up missing in the area and they were being found in wooded areas, uh, literally miles and miles outside of Atlanta. Some bodies being buried and found next to other bodies. But see, the FBI, the police, all of them, they started getting hip to what was going on. Like this was becoming a big, big thing, right? Now it was getting national attention. People like Sammy Davis Jr. came in and started doing like shows to raise awareness for the Atlanta child murders. Like a lot of children were dying all the time or being found strung out places all the time during this two year period. Y'all, it got to the point where like the world wanted to know what was going on. So the authorities started thinking outside the box. They were like, all right, if we're patrolling all of these wooded areas, it may become hard for uh, whoever's doing this to continue dumping bodies. What else, where else would they dump bodies? And someone suggested maybe off bridges into large bodies of water. So they put officers at like 25 potential points Y'all, this officer was waiting at the bottom of this one big water source with a bridge and he hears something hit the water. Choosh! He radios, something just hit the water. At the opposite of the end of the bridge, there was a police officer waiting. They see a station wagon come to the end of the bridge and turn around and go back around. They stop it and who is it? None other than Wayne Williams. Now, they don't know what he dropped over the bridge. All they heard was something fall over the bridge, hit water, and his car was the car that was stopped on the other end of that bridge. That's all they knew. Circumstantial at best, right? That's what put them on the Wayne's butt. And then two days later, they end up finding a body that washes in that same area down river, right? Now they own Wayne, they searching his stuff, searching his car, searching his house, find evidence that links him to the bodies. That's how they arrest Wayne. Wayne goes to trial, gets found guilty of two murders, two life sentences, right? But people believe that once that was done, the police just kind of just stopped, stopped searching and just put everything on him. All these open cases, they just closed them and put them on Wayne. So no one really actually knows if Wayne was the actual culprit of all the murders or if any of them. But today we're here at one of his victims. It was a nine year old by the name of Yusef Ali Bell. And you see Yusuf was actually walking to the corner store to buy some snuff for his neighbor Yusuf didn't have any shoes on. He didn't have a shirt on. He just had like these khaki shorts. Look, it's Atlanta and it's Georgia. It's it's okay to walk barefoot through the road. <laughs> it, well, back then, probably not. 
Not now, because you probably get diabetes, tetanus, <laughs> and, and all of the above doing that now. But they said after he bought the snuff, he was walking out, and witnesses say that they saw him speaking to someone driving a blue car. He gets in the car, and that's the last people see of little Yusuf alive. They find Yusuf, uh, his body, inside of an elementary school, an abandoned elementary school, in like a shaft. One of the janitors or cleaners was going in there trying to find a place to use the bathroom and ended up stumbling across, yeah, the body of little Yusuf. So we're here today. We want to visit his grave, pay our respect, and see if maybe Yusuf can answer a few questions. I know his mother is still looking for answers, and so are a lot of people. Let's get to it. Oh, yeah, I see Big Red right there. Look at this. Would y'all want y'all head engraved on y'all's headstone? I think that's kind of cool. In loving memory of Lucius H. Hosey, 1842 to 1920, a bishop, an orator, a lecturer, and an eloquent preacher of the gospel. This memorial is erected 1927 AD by the preachers and members of the Colored Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal <laughs> Church in Georgia to whom he was the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Lucius H. Hosey. Bro, if they didn't put a word out for you, my brother, I felt like they was preaching on your headstone. But let's see if we can find Mr. Yusuf right here. Little Yusuf Ali Bell, December 31st. Dang. December 31st, 1969 to October 29th, 1979. Oh, wow. We're literally coming up on the anniversary of him passing. Oh, wow. I didn't even realize. That's how I be sometimes. You get drawn to do things at certain times that you don't even realize. Because what's today? I think I'm filming this on the 28th. Wow. Y'all, I was totally wrong. Today is Tuesday, October 29th. That is, I promise y'all, I promise you. I did not plan this at all. This is just the way that it worked out. I didn't even realize he passed away in October. Like I've been doing my reading, reading all of that, but just the dates and what date it is just hasn't corresponded yet. Look at this. Yusuf passed away October 29th, 1979. Just for so y'all know, I'm not lying. What is today? Tuesday, October 29th, same day as Mr. Yus Yusuf Ali's Bell's passing. So maybe, maybe with it being the day of, maybe he'll be more prone to speak to us. Let's see. All right, family. So we're here at the resting space of little Yusuf Ali Bell. Yusuf, my name is Daylin. I'm with a group of people called the Graveyard Shift. And what we do is we come to resting communities like this and we try to speak to those who may not have been spoken to in a very long time. I know today is a day that may bring back a lot of memories for you. 
a lot of bad memories. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Give me one second. That was crazy. That was crazy. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right. I'm so like fidgety right now. Like I heard like a whole bunch of like steps here to my left hand side. I can't even get this thing open fast enough. Was there someone or something running on the side of me? Did I hear a whole bunch of footsteps running next to me? Staying the light, chicken. So I. There's Rosemary. Okay, am I not supposed to be here? In there. Oh, well, I'm here to speak to somebody. Is that okay? So I'm here to speak to Yusuf. Something I'm you have. Say yes, sir. Okay. Is it okay if I speak to you, sir? Uh, no. Can we? No. Can you prefer not? I'm terrified. Why can't I speak to you, sir? Okay. Terrible. Well, I promise I'm here for the right reasons. Y'all, it sounds like there is a whole bunch of people protecting Yusuf right now. And like trying to stop us from having this conversation. Is that what y'all are picking up? Like, I didn't even get to fully explain while I was here. Like, it was, as soon as I was trying to tell Yusuf what was going on, it sounded like 10 people were running up on me. That's why I kind of jumped like that. I mean, the only thing that's over there is my car. And like over there in the distance is like the maintenance people. But what I heard was like, right, it was on this side of my vehicle. Like that's what made me jump so bad. Cause I was like, damn, what's running up on me that fast? 
Like that's what was nerve wracking. But I also have my rim pod right here. I'm not gonna touch it, nothing, it's just right here. If anybody wants to, you know, manipulate the rim pod, they can. Yusuf, if you don't wanna talk to me, if you ever just wanna let me know that you're here without talking, you can literally just touch this little machine that's by your headstone and that lets me know that you're here. So no pressure, no rush. But I've heard a lot of stories about what happened to you and your mother and just so many people just want to know the truth. So people have been, you know, put in trouble and arrested for the things that happened to you. But we would just like to know your side. And if the person that is, you know, arrested for it is actually the person that harmed you. But I do come in love, peace and respect to all those that are watching over you. So I understand how you could be and why you would be um, protective over this, this young child. But I come in peace, love and respect. And again, uh, I have a lot of people just watching and I just would like the world to know the truth. And if I can help facilitate the truth in any way, uh, I would, I'm, I'm down to do so. All right, let's see. To so the spirits resting and protecting here, may I speak to little Yusuf? No. <laughs> And Yusuf, are you here? Can you tell me your name? These so you're trying. I heard bail. I heard bail. Can you say your first name? I heard you say That's what it sounds like to me. I'm not going to get too excited. I'm going to keep getting up, y'all, because I'm, it's not too hot, but the sun is out. And I don't want the camera to overheat. So that's why I keep getting up to make sure the camera's still rolling. I thought I heard Yusuf, y'all. Y'all go back and listen, play it again, play it again, play it again, and tell me what you heard. I felt like I heard Yusuf, but again, there's a guy mowing over here, birds chirping, the wind's blowing. I could be hearing what I want to hear, so please, work with me with this. So Yusuf, thank you for coming through, my friend. Do you mind answering a few questions for me? What? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask you a few hard questions, okay? Okay, you so, Yeah. Do you remember the day that you got hurt? Do you remember how you got hurt? Yeah. I mean, 
Do you remember who hurt you? Can you tell me the name of the person that hurt you? You don't have to be afraid. You can tell us he cannot hurt you anymore. Can you please tell me the name of the man that hurt you? Did you say when? I could say it was him. So is the man who was arrested now for your murder the man that did it? Are you sure that the man who's arrested, Wayne Williams, is the man that hurt you? <laughs> I moved it about. Check the camera, y'all. Yeah. Yusuf, can you tell me how he hurt you? Do you remember how he hurt you? Do you remember where he left you? Do you remember what kind of building he left you in? Did you try to get away? Was it more than one person? I Yusuf, can you tell me how he got your attention? Did you know he was going to hurt you when you first met him? You 
I'm gonna try the Necrophonic app just for a few questions. It seems like Yusuf knows who harmed him and is not hiding from it. Yusuf, I'm gonna try another. I don't understand why it has to be so dark. Um, Yusuf, can you talk to me using this application? Can you tell me who I'm talking to? Okay, what's your name? I need you to be a little more clear with your name. Okay. Do you feel comfortable speaking to me? I was just about to ask you, can you tell me the name of the person that hurt you? You said kill him? Can you say his name one more time? Why can't you say his name? Yo, Necrophonic is just always so weird to me, but they give some some pretty interesting responses at times. Yusuf, before I leave you, can you touch this machine by your headstone? Can you make it go off? Can you make your head the the machine by your headstone go off? Here, I'm gonna cut this on and I'm gonna walk off for a second. Feel free to talk, Yusuf. Uh, 
just had Now, did you slip off or did you get pushed off? Okay, Yusuf. Thank you for your time, brother. Wait, you, are you with the other victims? Uh, do, you all, do you all meet up up there or do you just spend time with your respective families? Do you keep up with what's going on with Wayne now that he's in jail? Are you pleased with what has happened to him? His punishment so far? Does someone keep walking around me? Did someone just walk around me? Alright y'all, there's definitely something or somebody moving around around here. Alright, thank you. Yeah. I think Wayne is responsible for sure. For sure. For sure. Just from speaking to little Yusuf, just a little bit that he did say. But what's interesting, it does seem like there was some force here that was protective over him. It was almost like we didn't protect you in the natural life, but we will protect you in the afterlife. And you have to set your intentions. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Do you think Wayne Williams is responsible for all the murders of all the people attached to the Atlanta child murder case? It's interesting. Love, love, love. See you next time. It is not closed until Yusef is located and he's safe at home. Sergeant Sturgis is one of only three officers assigned to the Atlanta Police Missing Person Squad. Right now, all three are working on a single case. Nine-year-old Yusuf Bell, who's been missing since Sunday. 
The nine-year-old is only one of about 500 missing or runaways the squad handles each year. How can three people work 500 cases? We put a very high priority on small children missing and very elderly people. That's the only way we can do it. Nine-year-old Yusuf Bell, whose case is getting the highest priority, lived in this apartment complex with his mother, who's divorced. There are three other brothers and sisters. This is Yusuf's 10-year-old brother, Jonathan. Their mother says they look a lot alike. People often mistake them for each other. Yusuf was last seen three days ago. He was running an errand for a woman who lived in the apartment complex. He came to this little store at the corner of McDaniel and Georgia Avenue. He bought a box of snuff for her. She gave him 60 cents. He got 18 cents change, and that's all he had with him when he disappeared. This is Yusuf. His hair is much shorter now. He's extremely bright, is in the gifted children's program at school. His mother says the whole neighborhood has been involved in the search. And if there's somebody out there like that that has him, I just wish they knew that somebody here loves him, that a whole lot of people love him, that this whole community loves him, and they want him back, too. Sergeant Sturgis says Yusuf is one of four young boys who've disappeared during the past few months. We have several young boys that are still missing, and the circumstances are unusual. It's not the same circumstances as that of any runaway. They're a little older than Yusuf. Sergeant Sturgis says she's not ready to say there's a pattern or the same persons involved, but she says there's always that possibility. They want to hear from you if you have information, but because of the manpower shortage, they're only there from 8 in the morning to 8 at night, Monday through Friday. If it's an emergency, Sergeant Sturgis says an officer will call them at home at night. Youth missing persons. Don McClellan, Action News Tonight. It's not how long you live, but how well. That's what Reverend B.J. Johnson told the people who filled the church on Glen Street. And everybody agreed that Yusef Bell had lived very well indeed. Not materially, but spiritually. His intelligence, his love of life, his abilities were praised as gifts of God. And God had taken Yusef back. There was no other explanation for his brutal, unsolved murder, but there was hope. For a little child shall leave them. And it is my hope at this particular point that the conscience of this city, the conscience of this community, the conscience of this nation will be touched, will be penetrated by the life and by the death of this young man. A lot of tears were shed for this little nine-year-old leader, despite suggestions that this was not a time for sadness. But we come by today not to cry, we come by today not to drop and droop and not to be broken, but we come by today to thank God for yourself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all we're here for. There have been many sad moments in this year of crime in Atlanta. This was one of the saddest, but also one of the most inspiring. Paul Miller, Action News.